1973, I purchased a game called Atlanta by Don Lowry and published by Gidon Games. And it became one of my favorite campaign Civil War games for quite a while. It kind of became Holy Grail status after a while, since it had gone out of print and was very hard to get. And I later traded it away for another Grail game that I had. And uh, I always wished that it would be reprinted someday by somebody. And lo and behold, in 2021, it was reprinted. The publisher was this lock and load, and they did a very good job on the game indeed. They added a subtitle, Atlanta Campaign, The Death of Dixie. They did a very good job on the counters. They made them larger, much more distinctive than the original. They did a beautiful map. And, of course, they added uh, the cards, which were an integral part of the uh, original game, too. Did a nice job on those, too. Now, uh, I, won't do, I won't be reviewing this game, actually. I'll, I'm going to show it off a little bit, but I'm not going to do a review of it. And uh, you'll soon see why. Of course, the game featured a new terrain effects chart to reflect the new map and a more colorful combat results table. Let's take a quick look at the map, which was very well done. As you can see, this map was much more colorful than the original yet maintaining the integrity and the terrain features of the original. Here you've got Dalton, where Johnson's army was more or less uh, ensconced on Rocky Face Ridge. The Union army was up here. There's Resaca going down the track to Adairsville. Alatoona Pass, Big Shanty, and eventually get down to Atlanta itself over here. Uh, for those of you who want to know what the game was about, um, I did a video on the original one a few years ago, and that still holds up well. It's um, still one of my favorite uh, campaign games of the Civil War. Okay, we fast-forwarded from 1973 to 2021. Let's go back in time again to around 2015. That's when I first discovered the great campaigns of the Civil War which I think dates back to the 80s. So I've got about what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven titles in the series. I don't have um, the latest one, which was Hood's Campaign. Um, that campaign doesn't interest me quite as much. But in 2018, I did purchase the uh, game Atlanta is Ours, and uh, this is a valuable volume in that series. This is an incredibly detailed campaign game about the Atlanta campaign. Far more detailed than Don Lowry's was. Which doesn't mean uh, I don't like the Don Lowry game uh, at all. Uh, it's That's a great game and I still like it. But if you want to study the Atlanta campaign in detail, this game certainly um, will do that. Which brings me to present day and the subject of the video of the two games Atlanta Campaign or Atlanta is ours, which one do I like best? Well, I, I just can't make a decision. This is the more detailed one. I call it advanced level. This one is the more playable one. But the video I want to do today is about Atlanta is ours, what I'm discovering about the game. And I can show you a little bit about uh, it and uh, how great a simulation it really is. Now, by 1864, entrenchments were becoming part and parcel of the campaigns of the Civil War. They were used extensively in both the Eastern Campaign, with Robert E. Lee and Grant, and uh, the Western Campaign, with Johnson and uh, Sherman. Now, if you take a look at these, you know, old photographs by George Bernard of the entrenchments, you can just see how impregnable they are. I mean. The Chevaux de Free. Look at this place. Entrenchments by this time are almost impossible to take. Um, and works like this prefigured the entrenchments that would later feature in World War I. And as Grant and Sherman soon found out, attacking entrenchments only leads to 
huge casualties with very little gain for it. Now the game features a very long and narrow campaign map. That's because most of the campaign centered around the Western and uh, Atlantic Railroad. We're just going to follow the map down from Dalton, Kingston, Resaca, and you can see the map is quite long and skinny. Apologies for the glare there. And there's the city of Atlanta. So it's a very interesting campaign and very, very linear. Now what I've done is set up my favorite scenario, which is the opening campaign. Now scenario 18 is called the Hardest Knocks, and it's the scenario I favor the most because it's the scenario that begins on May 7th. I always like to study the opening moves of any campaign, and this is the scenario that fits the bill. Now it's an advanced game scenario, and I'm not playing with the advanced rules. I'm still quite content with the standard game. So what I'm going to do is play a few turns of the opening moves of this scenario, but using the standard uh, rules. A lot of the advanced rules don't come into play till your weeks into the campaign, and that won't matter because I'm more interested in those opening moves. Okay, we're going to begin at Rome, Georgia, where Martin's forces are, and just move up the Ustanula River to show you that all the ferries and bridges have been destroyed. That fort in the middle there is that's Resaca, where Johnson had a small force. And now we'll move up to Johnson's main line around Dalton. Now this is Dalton here. This is Rocky Face Ridge, Doug Gap, and Johnson's heavily fortified line. And this is Sherman's army approaching from the north. That's the setup I prefer, but there is another open setup where you can have forces come in from a little bit more north and to the west. But I'm interested in exploring the historical scenario, so this is the one I'm going to look at today. As I mentioned, fortifications at this time of the war were pretty formidable. So Sherman had a plan, and with a bit of luck, it could have worked and have been quite disastrous for Johnson. And I'll try to show you what that plan was. Okay, his plan was to move McPherson's Corps down through this area here, past Dug Gap, and go through Snake Creek Gap into Sugar Valley and take Resaca in Johnson's rear. And the plan nearly succeeded. McPherson got his corps down here and was intimidated a little bit by the fortifications. He didn't know how small the force was there. He hesitated. And it was in that hesitation that allowed Johnson to quickly move the army back and entrench at Resaca, and the campaign was on. Now had Sherman's, or rather McPherson's corps got in Johnson's rear here, God knows what would have happened. Many historians say, well, the campaign would be over, Johnson's army would be destroyed. Well, maybe. Um, the army might have had to scatter and to east. We'll never know what would have happened. We do know that if it had succeeded, it could have been pretty ugly for Johnson's army. So that's what I'd like to explore in the game. And I'm going to do a few moves of the game to give you an idea what the system is about. But there's many videos out there already teaching the system, and I can't teach you the system any better than, let's say, Patrick's videos out there. He's got a bunch of very good teaching videos, and I suggest you uh, take a look at those. So let's do a couple of moves here in the opening moves of the Atlanta campaign and see where it goes. Now the stacks in this game can get a little unwieldy, so I suggest you use the uh, force display cards and in association with the force markers, you can keep these stacks uh, relatively uh, playable. Now, I met a fellow at WBC one year, and he was selling these uh, cards, which I'm using now in place of the force markers. 
you still use the force marker, but these cards can travel with the marker put nearby on the map. Makes them very convenient. So here we have force one here, force two there, force three, and so on. I find them very handy. You have some variables for the setting up of uh, McPherson's army, Army of the Tennessee, and I've chosen to have him come in on this road here. Now, McPherson doesn't come in till turn two, so it's on turn two that he will attempt to do what Sherman wanted to do, and that is outflank the Confederates and go through Snake Creek Gap. So I'm going to try that same strategy. So let's get on with the game. We'll roll for initiative, see who moves first. Now generally, Sherman will be pushing in the cavalry and uh, trying to get close to Johnson's main line. But his main objective is to outflank. So I think we're going to be able to um, simulate the opening of the campaign fairly well, I hope. And you'll see that this game is very much a maneuver game. You just don't want to be bashing your forces against these forts on Rocky Face Ridge. That would be totally counterproductive. So let's see where this goes. Okay, I've just rolled for initiative, rolling tie, and uh, that means the Confederates will move first. So I'll very likely move the Confederate cavalry, because with hindsight, we know that this force here under Hooker can rapidly move into the Confederate rear, so I'll probably have to adjust the Confederate cavalry. Okay, so I'm going to activate Joe Wheeler's cavalry. He rolls two dice, and because he's a cavalry corps leader, he'll be adding three. So I rolled an eight, so Wheeler's going to have 11 movement points. So let's catch the movement after Wheeler is moved. Now one thing I keep forgetting about and don't you forget it, is the leader transfer phase, which actually comes before we roll the dice. So I'm going to have Hume transfer over to this stack here. Why? Because Grigsby, it would be out of command then. So that's something I missed. But Wheeler has 11, and let's see what he can do. Okay, that's after Joe Wheeler has moved his cavalry. He's moved up Hume's here to block the pass block here and maintain ZOI across the Confederate front. So roll for initiative again, see who goes first. It's the Confederates again. Going to activate Kelly's cavalry this time, see what he gets. He gets uh, eight movement points. Okay, that's his moved taking fatigue one of course and he's just screening over here the confederate right flank. Let's roll again see who has the initiative. This time the Union has the initiative. So we'll probably end up moving Hooker's force here to push these cavalry out of the way. Okay Hooker did very well on that turn that's because Grigsby in his cavalry retreat rolled a one and disintegrated. So Hooker's core crash through the mountain passes. Let's see who moves first. It's the Confederates. What are they going to do about that? Okay, Joe Wheeler got eight movement points and he fell back to close this pass and fell back here. Um, the Confederates are really feeling the pressure already because Kilpatrick's cavalry force is a force to be reckoned with, and it could come crashing through Crockster's Gap here, and uh, the uh, Confederates may have to move their infantry a lot earlier than I suspected. Let's see who rolls or who moves first. It's the Union. I think the Confederates are off to a bad start. Okay, Thomas's Army of the Cumberland, along with Sherman, moved directly forward approaching uh, Wheeler's cavalry. They know there's only a screen in front of them, so they have nothing to worry about. Let's see who moves next. The Confederates move. Okay, I'm a bit worried that we're not slowing down the western column quick enough, so I've decided to strip the Confederate cavalry under Kelly and move down here, who will eventually move west. 
Now you can't see all the fatigue markers. Some of them are hidden underneath the units. I'd rather be able to, uh, you to see the historical units rather than the fatigue. But you can be sure that uh, each turn I'm moving, uh, I am marking fatigue. And that's beginning to tell on the union column because it's already at two fatigue here and uh, I don't want the uh, men to be tired out before the game even begins. Let's see who moves next. Okay, and another bold move. I took McCook's Union Cavalry and dashed it around the Confederate right. He got 11 movement points and that got him pretty far. So uh, I think the Confederates are slowly getting outflanked and they will have to react to that pretty soon. Okay, rolling for initiative. And the Confederates go first. Pretty sure this time I'm going to have to move some infantry. Let's take a look at the situation. Okay, I activated Hardy that turn. And there's some special rules. Turns 1 to 7 for any Confederate Corps leader moving any other division in other corps. So Hardy moved three divisions. One, Stuart walked Doug Creek's Gap. And another division here, Walker moved down and Brown. So the Confederates are beginning to react to the Union flanking movement. Okay, the Union player got the initiative and Schofield marched his army of the Ohio straight down the railroad track opposite the Confederates. Let's see who moves first. That'll be a Union player again. Okay, the Union did a very basic logical move. They moved Howard's Corps straight up to fill this gap. So they have a continuous front of ZOY opposite the Confederates. Who moves next? Union again. Okay, the Union player doesn't really want to get his cores up to fatigue level 3. So I'm activating Thomas's core and they're going to use hasty attacks and Retreat before combat for the Confederate cavalry, no doubt, and push Wheeler aside. On Wheeler's side, let's hope he doesn't roll any ones and get destroyed. Let's see how that goes. Okay, Thomas's corps did advance, but when they caused the retreat of Wheeler's cavalry, they lost two movement points. So Wheeler did slow them down, but uh, this brigade here. Mr. Harrison is mighty fatigued. Let's see who moves next. Okay, Hood activated that time and he got eight movement points. But it wasn't a very desirous move. Um, he had to fall back. He's abandoned forts and he's giving up ground quickly. Now the Union are close on his heels but they're getting fatigued. But the game is going pretty well the way I thought it would go. The Rocky Face Ridge position is easily can be made untenable. And that's exactly what's happening. Let's see who moves next. It'll be the Union. This could get ugly. Okay, Howard activated. He got a good movement die roll too. So he was able to occupy the abandoned Confederate trenches here, getting adjacent even to Hinman. So he's hard pressing the Confederate. Now from my reading, I can really appreciate Joseph E. Johnson's dilemma and his ability to retreat his army intact to Rosaka. This is going to be a tough withdrawal. Very tricky. Interesting situation though. Not a lot of combat, but maneuver here is very critical. Okay, the Confederates got to move there. It's lucky they did because Hood pulled back the last of the Confederate line to just below Dalton. They're really feeling the pressure now. Bates is holding that gap, but virtually all of the Confederate fortifications north of Dalton have now been abandoned. And nope, they haven't. I see one fella left. Hindman. I don't know if I've used up my three or not. No, I haven't. Okay, Hinwin will have to move. Okay, that's better looking, but not 
not a desirable position to be in. The Confederates are now south of Dalton. They're now in open terrain, not doubled. But fortunately, the Union is kind of fatigued and probably can't pursue. Let's see who moves next. The Confederates again. Okay, I activated Cheatham, but he didn't get a very good movement roll, only four. So he moved some of the wagons south, kept the main line intact. Initiative. It's a tie, so the Confederates get to move again. Okay, Cheatham got a good roll that turn. So he evacuated. They dug gap and scooted two units far, far south. Let's see who moves first. Confederates again. Okay, the Confederate line is pretty stable now. They activated Hardy, and he more or less moved the wagon trains further south. So the Confederates may end up passing in the next turns. Let's see what happens next. Okay, the Union got the initiative, and McCook's cavalry, now at fatigue two, managed to get again into the Confederate right rear. God knows where that will end up. Let's see who moves next. The Confederates. I'll take a look at the situation, and the Confederates may pass. I'm not sure. Well, I didn't like having to go to fatigue three, but I had to move a Confederate brigade to block McCook, so only Dubrell, Dubrell moved in to block McCook. Initiative. Union. Okay, we've got a thunderstorm out there, so I've had to add some supplemental lighting. All right, so we left off. The Union had the initiative, and I'll have to do a survey of their forces and see what I'm going to do, because they're all getting pretty fatigued now, and I don't want to get them too high up, so we might go on to turn two. Let's just see what they can do. Okay, but the only core that's Half decent right now is Schofield. He's at uh, fatigue one. So he'll edge up, probably take these Confederate forts, depending on what he rolls, and we might end the turn there. Okay, Schofield got a half decent roll, so he edged up his core right into Dalton, right opposite Johnson's main line. Now, I don't think there's anything more the Confederates can do. I don't think there's much more the Union can do, so I'm going to call it there. Each side will pass. I'll do the administration phase, get rid of all these fatigue markers, and we'll go on to turn two. But I'll end the video here and call it part one, and we'll see what happens in part two. Thank you for watching.